So we're going to have uh, Alex coming all the way from Amsterdam. Thank you, uh, React Amsterdam. And uh, he's going to talk about Apollo client, the stuff no one ever told ya. <laughs> yeah, that's, that sounds really interesting. OK, so hi, London. How are you doing tonight? Okay, so I really hope that you enjoyed the evening so far, because I personally do, and I really hope I can contribute to this vibe today. Uh, but before I'm gonna start with the talk, I'd like to spend like a minute for the shameless promotion of the guys who sent me here. So I want to say big thanks, like even huge thanks to React Amsterdam for making this event possible for me personally. And in the case if you're not familiar with these guys, here we go. So React Amsterdam is the biggest React conference worldwide, at least so far. Last year it was like 1,200 attendees and more than 25 speakers, two tracks, so it was really dope. Um, come on. Um, so this year it's going to be also two tracks. These are the guys who, and girls of course, who are going to talk at React Track and we have these people, and even me in the right-up corner, uh, speaking about React Native. In addition to that, it's going to be an extended program with some after-party, pre-party, and what is quite unique, Amsterdam Exploration Day. I think this is, uh, yeah, this is really pretty unique. Especially if you're going to survive the after-party, you know? Um, so you know what you're going to do, right? Like, follow these guys, ask them whatever you want, or you can ask me after this talk. And speaking of which, I think it's a good time to start talking about the topic, right? But, oh, no, no, not yet. So this is me. My name is Alexi Kareev. This is my Twitter handle. And um, I'm a Russian engineer working for the Dutch company, living in Amsterdam, and in my spare time doing some open source and writing some Medium articles. So if you're interested about internals of React Native or query components with uh, Apollo, Go for this handle, and you will find whatever you want. OK, so Apollo. How many people here have some experience with Apollo, at least some basic experience with Apollo? OK, OK. How many of you ever heard of GraphQL? Wow, that's cool. OK, um, it still seems like I need to talk at least a little bit about some basics of GraphQL, how it's different from the rest, because this is really like crucial for the rest of the talk. And probably, yeah, let's get started with this. First of all, um, REST and GraphQL. No, 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 look, I'm not here to talk some bad things about REST. REST is great. Um, however, I personally think that GraphQL is better, but um, personal opinions aside, um, REST, the core idea of the REST is that you're working with resources, right? You have uh, deterministic URLs um, that basically represents the resource. And our backend uh, controls how we're going to get this resource. So the shape, um, everything, literally. With a GraphQL, it's a little bit different. Because um, backend in that case just provides you something like a schema and resolvers for all the fields that you might uh, query from the backend. And the schema of the data that we're going to retrieve from the backend comes from the client. So basically, it's up to us to say, like, OK, I want this resource and this resource and other resource in just one query. So we don't have to create multiple um, HTTP connections or just multiple requests. We can put whatever we want into one request and just go for it. And GraphQL going to resolve it for us. So now let's talk a little bit about operations that you can perform with uh, GraphQL. Uh, in the very beginning, you can uh, query data. I think I don't need even to explain this. Uh, you can mutate the data on the server. You can create entity. You can update entity. You can also like remove entity if you want. And subscriptions. Uh, well, it literally subscribes you to some updates that comes from the backend. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about it, about it a little bit later. For now, um, let's try to figure out what's the general pattern we have for GraphQL. So we have operation type, which can be query mutation or subscription. We have operation name, and this operation name 
basically just like a name of your regular functions that you write in JavaScript. It can be, yeah, literally whatever. You can even omit writing operation name. However, you don't want to, you know, debug stuff without, uh, without name. It's like anonymous function, anonymous function, anonymous function. Doesn't help much, right? So, um, and the third one gonna be parameters. Uh, parameters, well, like in the REST query, you can also pass parameters. This is the way how you pass parameters to queries and mutations in GraphQL. And inside curly brackets, you have list of fields. These fields also can have parameters. And I think it does make sense to give you a proper example instead of this. So the first example is going to be about uh, queries. And query is something that is used to retrieve information from the server. So the example query will look like this. So we have operation type query, um, operation name user query with parameter ID of type integer. These exclamation marks means that this field is not nullable. And inside we want to, um, we want to query a resource called user. And this resource, in order to be resolved, requires an ID. And this is a parameter that we pass to the user query. Um, back from this resource, we would like to have name and email. And this is exactly what you're going to get once uh, this query will be resolved. So the second one is going to be mutation, and it's used to alternate information on the server. So as I already mentioned, to create, update, or delete entity. Um, so example of mutation going to look like this. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. so. This is an example. Uh, we use operation type uh, mutation, then operation name username mutation with uh, parameters of ID again and the string, and oh sorry, and the name of type string, where the name is going to be a value that we want to update on the server. So we call edit username uh, mutation on the backend, and we pass ID of the user entity that we want to change and the new name that we want to update. And back, we want to get new name. Well, this is probably a dummy example, but still, this is the way how it works. Uh, the last but not the least is GraphQL subscriptions. So um, this is the feature that allows um, the server to send um, updates to its clients whenever something happens on the backend. Usually, it's implemented using WebSockets. So probably, if you ever had an experience with uh, WebSockets, you know how it works. Um, yeah, and this is basically how it looks like. It's exactly like query, but instead of query, operation type is subscription. Most of the work is done by the backend um, and by Apollo client, so you don't need to create anything extra here. Okay, I really hope that this is like more or less clear and this is something that we're going to operate, um, operate on further in this talk. And this talk is actually was supposed to be about query splitting. But again, you really need to understand these um, concepts of uh, GraphQL in order to understand what we're going to do here. But I'm not like you know, I'm not a fan of uh, doing some kind of theoretical talks. So we're going to go through the real example. I had to build something similar quite some time ago. Basically, it's like a um, list of entities. Let's say, let's put it this way. In this particular example, it's going to be a shopping cart of automobile details. Um, and then it's going to have only one interaction. You're going to click on the item and you're going to um, see the details view, or whatever you call it. Um, I believe it's a very well-known pattern. I don't have to explain this. So now let's talk about data that we actually need in order to um, fetch, let's say, a list of these entities. I would compose something like this. It's going to be a query called uh, shopping cart list. And inside it, I'm going to have uh, products. Uh, this resource is going to be going to be an array. So basically, I'm going to get back an array with uh, product entities that are going to contain ID, title, preview, and the price. I hope it's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, the next one, this is something that I'm going to need uh, in order to display details view. So it's also query. Now we have some additional parameters. For instance, uh, we query product, like one product, not products, just product, with uh, ID. So we saying explicitly what exactly we want to get. And then, in addition to the fields that we already have, uh, we want to query some extras, right? We want to know about availability, discount value, description, and so on. However, we have some duplication here. 
you probably already noticed that, like title preview price, um, it happens to be in boss queries. I'd like to clean it up before we go further. So I would move them into fragments because it will be really, well, really easier to follow the code using the fragments. So we basically put part of our queries um, just into the fragment and then we use these fragments like this. So in the shepherd card list, we take only preview, preview data, slice of data, and on the product info, we're gonna take preview data and details data. But here comes like one issue. You know, we don't want to overfetch preview data because we already fetched it in the shopping cart list query and it's already in the cache. So there is absolutely no point to fetch it twice. And we can actually read it from the cache. And let's take a look how to do that. First of all, I believe I need to explain how the cache works in Apollo Client. It is on a very high level. There are, of course, way more things to it, but let's try to keep it rolling. Apollo Client has a default cache implementation called in-memory cache, and it's a normalized data storage for all the queries and all the resources that you ever requested. So really don't get confused by this normalized data storage. It basically means that every time when you're fetching something, um, Apollo tries to normalize what, whatever you have and store it in a flattened manner inside the hash map uh, with other cached entities. So it looks actually something like this. If we fetch um, details, yeah, if we fetch the query product with ID one, this is what we're gonna get in the, as a response. And as you can see, it's not cached uh, inside the product entity in the root query, but it's cached aside from that. So it's really flat. Uh, the idea with that is that because you can write multiple different queries and theoretically, all these multiple different queries should be able to reuse the same information from the cache. And yeah, basically that's how storing to the cache works. Every time when you uh, fire a query, the query is added to the root queries and all the data that you fetch from this query goes uh, to the hash map with the other entities. Uh, you might notice that we use that like product uh, colon one. So basically every time when we query something, uh, on the back end we have a GraphQL schema and this GraphQL schema have types. So type for the product that we queried, um, you can see like force line from the bottom, type name equals product. So Apollo takes this type name and attaches ID to it. Uh, there are some ways how you can change that, but you probably don't want to do that. Uh, unless you really have some reasons and this talk is not relevant if you know how to do it and why you need to do that. Um, so now when we know how it's stored, let's take, oh wow, time is flying. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so let's take a look how we can read data from the cache. So the first one uh, gonna be read query. It's an API that a uh, client exposes to you. Uh, the only difference with like just regular query would be that uh, if you use read query, it's only gonna hit the cache. If there are some fields that are not in the cache or not related to this entity, this one gonna throw. It's just gonna say like, okay, sorry, I just, I just can't do that. Um, the other way would be to say read fragment. And of course it's gonna read only the fragment. And the difference with the previous one aside from that it reads fragment, it also requires an ID, always, because fragments are also atta always attached to some entities and entities should have IDs. This is like requirement. And last but not the least is uh, to use query, query components. How many of you heard of query components at all? Oh wow, okay, okay. So basically this is a declarative way of how you can fetch data using Apollo Client. So the idea is that instead of using client.query and go through that, you can um, use query component, supply query there, and then in the children, you're gonna pass a function that's gonna take only one parameter, which is um, query result, I believe, uh, which contains all the information about your query. Like, is it loading? What's the network status? What is the data? And is it resolved or not? So, um, this is something that we're gonna use in our examples. So let's create a shopping list screen, basically 
go straight to the point here. Uh, we use query components. We already have this shopping cart list. So we just query that and we render stuff here. Like if we, if we have data, we render data. If it's still loading, we render loading screen. I hope this is clear. Um, so we can, do, we can try to do exactly the same for the product info screen. However, we won't avoid this issue with overfetching. We will still overfetch stuff. And this is bad. So how it's actually going to be? Like we're going to say, OK, dear cache, we have this query. Please give me this information. And cache is like, oh, no, you know what? I don't have all this information. I only have like part of this information. So I'm not going to give you anything. And this is like bad. But what can we do about that? Probably if we query something, we already know that some information might be in the cache. So what I'm proposing to do to say like, OK, we know that ANC might be already in the cache. So please give me ANC from the cache. And it gives me this ANC from the cache. But I still need to fetch B. So I basically split my query into two. And one query goes only to the cache. And another query goes to the server. Uh, let's try to recompose our details view query in order to reflect this. So yeah, this is what I already said. Um, OK, so query to get cache data. Um, it's literally just a query uh, with one product, and it contains only the preview, because this is important. Preview is something that we already fetched. We already fetched preview at the moment when we fetched the list. Uh, so it should be in the cache. And we use query component and fetch literally this query. And it should be resolved because we already hit the list. Inside uh, this function that we have uh, on this query component, we're going to render the second one. And the second one is going to be more or less similar, however, a little bit more complicated. But it's going to fetch the rest. Here, you might see that uh, we have additional parameter called full. And basically, it's just a flag. And we decide if we want to include preview or not based on this flag. Um, this flag is set uh, inside the variables. And we check if data product exists or not. And this is something that we query right here in the cache query, right? So if data.product uh, can be retrieved from the cache, then we're going to have it here. And then we don't need to include preview. Otherwise, we include the entire thing. For instance, if you shared link uh, to the details view to your friend, then probably this friend never hit uh, the list of products or whatsoever. So he or she will need to fetch everything. And this is basically a use case for this full flag and check for um, if product is already fetched. So you can also try it out. Oh, no, 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 wait. The last one. All this won't work if we won't use cache redirect. But I'm already over the time, so I will try to go quickly about this. Um, if you remember, I pinpointed that we have like um, root queries in the cache. So the idea is like when we're trying to get an entity for the product and the request was never fired before, so we don't have anything in the root queries. And at that moment of time, um, Apollo just doesn't know that this information exists somewhere else. Basically, there is no reference to this cache information uh, from the root queries. So we have to remap it manually. We're going to say like, OK, if we request this information for the product, uh, just go and get the cache key uh, using type name product and ID that you supplied and try to resolve it. Just hit me afterwards. I will explain it in details, really. Um, OK, and uh, you can try it out. There is a sandbox. Um, also, ask me on Twitter if you have any kind of questions about that. Um, and before I finish, I want to say big thanks to this guy because he actually draw everything. So he really deserves some kind of applause, I think. <laughs> thanks. OK, and before I round it off, I want to say that organizers of React Amsterdam gave me this discount code for 50% discount on the conference. So make sure you're going to use it at the moment when you're going to book tickets. Huh? Yes? OK, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Do we have any questions?
could you put up the slide with the sandbox URL again? I missed it. Which one, sorry? The sandbox URL. Um, sandbox, sure. Yeah. yeah, 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 this one. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. Cheers. So um, w with your, um, your query uh, component, uh, setting a cache policy as a kind of element of view concern, what kind of scenarios is that useful in where you are describing a view hierarchy and you want to say in this scenario I want to behave differently in terms of how I access data? Um, it's hard to imagine. Can you like make a, a little bit more concrete example? Um, so yeah, so this is the first time I've seen a, a query. Oh, query components. components in general, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm interested in when you show the um you know setting the the access policy there yeah why that is something that you would want to do in the context of describing a view okay sure well basically sometimes uh i already know that some information should be like in the cache for instance in this in this particular case um if i go like here e this one i already know that uh information uh, from the product info cache should be already cached and therefore I want to say like never hit the server to fetch this information. Like if I use fetch policy cache only then Apollo will only go to cache in order to resolve this information and basically if it will fail resolving this then data will be just undefined and here as you can see I assign an empty object here because uh, at the moment when I'm gonna use that here in the line uh, with variables, I say data.product, but if data is uh, undefined, then it will be like accessing property product of undefined. So that's why I need this like previous line. Um, yeah, more or less, that's, that's like it, I think. Does it answer your question? Um, yeah, I'll think on it, thanks. <laughs> okay. It, yeah. <laughs> it's good I did not, it's making my gym. Hi, thanks uh, for the talk. Um, I feel like the cache, uh, it should be something, it should be uh, in its pro proper, like it's in own layer and being taken care of completely by Apollo and be abstracted away from us. And because here it feels like it's a bit fiddly or, yeah, doesn't, I would just wonder what the, co the code would look like if you do that everywhere. Sure, yeah, I completely understand your question and your frustration in the very first place because um, I would also assume that by default uh, Apollo should be smart enough to go and fetch information from the cache first and then go and request some additional fields from the server only if they are really needed. And that's actually how it was implemented in the very beginning, like till version 0 0.5 or so. But then people started to complain then uh, sometime information in the cache is inconsistent because like some fields has been cached for a while, some fields has been fished in a different time frame and then it's like pretty hard to reason about that. But um, regarding like this verbose complexity and uh, just like general complexity, this is actually just like advanced case probably because Apollo actually cares about uh, cache and solves most of the things for you by default. So if you're gonna hit, um, for instance, the same query twice with the same parameters, it's gonna resolve it uh, from the cache. So it won't go to the server at all. But problem here is that it's two different queries and they share one piece of information. So basically the idea is like, um, Apollo just don't understand that it really needs to try to resolve this information from somewhere else because Apollo just thinks like this information doesn't exist. And uh, what I try to uh, share here is that you can actually help Apollo and tell like, okay, Apollo doesn't see this information. However, you're smart enough, you can uh, show Apollo where to look for this information, basically. So do you recommend to do that? Oh. I would say unless you have a like, real use case for that, I'd say no. However, uh, in my case, for instance, it was like details view was taking quite some time in order to to be fetched and I I just didn't want to show something like 
huge spinner on the entire list. So I wanted to show some information as soon as possible, especially in some cases when uh, network connection is kind of expensive or slow or whatever. So I really want to show um, UI immediately without waiting, especially if I already have this UI. So it's basically the case when you're aiming for the best UX you can probably have. In, in that kind of cases, I would go for that. Otherwise, I'd say just stick with the standard way of uh, using Apollo, and that's going to be just fine. Thank you. Thanks. Any other question? Well. Wait, wait, wait. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you saying that what you're doing there is that you're able to... So you able to uh, present an alternative view when you know that you have some pre-cached data yeah. and that's why this is this makes sense as a view concern I have another one if nobody has sure <laughs> uh, can you just talk uh, briefly because uh, I don't know when you mutate uh, when you do when you call a mutation, um, do you update manually the cache? If yeah, I mean I, I don't know how you do that. If you can do that, if Apple okay. does that for you. Well, the full version of this talk, which is 40 minutes, uh, <laughs> contains this part, <laughs> and it's called like well, basically, if I understood it correctly, you're talking about like optimistic UI. So let's say you want to add something. Well, you want to create a new entity on the server, so you fire this mutation with a new entity, but you want to display this entity like as soon as possible. Is it about that or not? Uh, no, it's more, let's say you have some data in the cache and you, modi you modify that data, but just you, you call um, a mutation. And then, so your cache is out of date basically. So yeah. will Apollo be smart enough to kind of know that or? Yeah, well, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but <laughs> mostly yes. I would put it like this, um, in the example with, um, where is it, here, with mutation, you basically can get some information back after the moment when you fire a mutation on the server, so you're saying like, okay, edit username, and as you can see in the curly brackets, I, I'm asking for a name back. I can ask for more information. And at the moment when I'm going to get this information, this information will update cached information in Apollo. So basically, this part is done automatically, but you need to uh, specify the fields that you want to get back and the fields that should be updated. Sometimes you need to update uh, some related entities. For instance, invalidate some cache and stuff like that. There are some hooks for that, but I think it would be pointless to show without the code. And I don't ho co have code by hand, but I can show you where to look in documentation for that. Cool, thanks. You're welcome. Any other question? So I think, thank you very much, Alex. You're very interesting.